Hello, my name is Elijah Worlds, and today it's my personal list of my top favorite films that came out in 2023. And without further ado, let's get on with it. But first, here are some honorable mentions. We have Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3, Wonka, and Chicken Run Dawn of the Nugget. For number 10, we have Dumb Money. Do you remember back at early 2021 or a couple years ago? where some ragtag team of Redditors uh, pretty much spiked up uh, stock prices for GameStop. And of course GameStop is still successful as it is at the moment, so a uh, film came out of it even though it didn't exactly uh, make a huge uh, bank in the box office like it did at uh, uh, like it did a couple of years uh, ago with that event. But honestly this is a very intriguing uh, depiction of like classified and welfare and Getting caught up in a, in the hype of all this, um, all this uh, uh, absolute mayhem that is uh, pretty much uh, this GameStop uh, plan and being anchored down by Paul Dino, who is definitely one of the most likable uh, protagonists uh, out there this year, and also a massively stellar cast like Sebastian Stan, Seth Rogen, Nick Offerman, and Pete Davidson, all of them great performances, and it also dives into the itty gritty of how things would have uh, would definitely have operated. Uh, in more of a classical sense of like the financial scheme, like how what the, the terminology of dumb, dumb money is, and how hedge fund managers essentially are just incredibly greedy people, like in two points in, inherent at best. But and also why this is essentially the the years David and Goliath story. Uh, even though I personally enjoyed it, even though I, I never really uh, uh, subscribed to this GameStop drama when uh, when it first came out. For number nine, we have David Fincher's The Killer. Michael Fassbender is on the roll and in his pretty much in a strong format at the moment and he's enjoying a bit of a comeback at the moment. Even though Next Goal Win uh, didn't uh, leave that much of an impression of anyone, but The Killer left in a bit of an impression on me, being based off a French graphic novel of a friend of a same name and of course uh, this is Denis Vill this is uh, David Fincher's like uh, Everything you must know about him, like his all of his signature trademarks and all that, and Michael Van Spenter uh, pretty much playing off of his strengths. And also, the movie is uh, very gorgeous, both cinematography wise, the very grindy industrial music by Trent Reznor and Atrus Ross, and of course, the fight scenes and the and almost uh, are brilliant. And the inner monologue, which the movie does dwell into, the uh, the mindset of, which is uh, somewhat fascinating to. Uh, see how how, how uh, bizarrely conflicted he is, and how almost disciplined he is at any job he does. Like the amount of dedication and and almost raw persistence. Like if anything goes wrong, he must have to write it at the end of the day. Like like this movie is just uh, one of the most edge of your seats, hard dropping uh, uh, insanity trips. Like this is just um, a treat for me. At number eight, we have Spider Man Across the Spider Verse. Okay, 2023 was not a good year for superhero movies. Like, yes, I said Guardians of the Galaxy uh, Volume 3 was a great film, but uh, Marvel was uh, more remembered how poorly it did in the box office, and uh, Ant Man was pretty disappointing, and DC was pretty much bomb after bomb after bomb at this point, not to mention the PR uh, a disaster that was Ezra Miller and uh, Zachary Levi and Amber Heard, so. Without further ado, at least uh, the superior movies had one saving grace. It's Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. Even though, again, I was a bit doubtful a titty bit uh, after I seen this movie, with people considering it one of the best uh, sequels ever made, one of the best animated movies ever made, I've, then I realised, I'm like, yes, this is actually really good. Even if, if it's a standalone movie, this is still absolutely brilliant. Like. The animation, even though it's a, pretty much a game apart from all the rest of that moment, it still feels like a massive, both in a massive improvement from the original and almost game changing, uh, like the original in the same way. And the character development is way more in depth, and we do, definitely do feel like we uh, earn more of a, learn more of the grasp of the multiverse as well. All the new characters are just as enthralling as the side characters as the original. The action scenes are pure insanity in my opinion. The music of Dan, Dan Publeton, uh, if I've mispronounced his name, is very on point and very chef's kiss. Um, all in all, this was a 
enthralling movie. Just hope uh, Beyond Spider-Verse uh, does swing by sooner rather than later, just because I want to see what Miles Morales is definitely cooking up at this point, because this was just grows on me. It just gets better and better the more I think about it. At number seven, we have Past Lives. Uh, after the flashy explosive affair that was Across the Spider-Verse, now let's go to the opposite direction, as in a more simple story about just catching up with an old friend from school that you were friends with from prim primary. And it's a movie that's very bittersweet and definitely well written and definitely brilliantly acted. Uh, particularly this is the debut film of Celie's Song, who is complete, who is a complete dynamite in this, uh, uh, in her own directorial film. Like, the movie is just uh, pretty satisfying to watch and go and go through. Like, I think we've all been through, re through these emotions. Like, when a friend moves away or you you pretty much play in your, in your head what uh, all the doubts are going in your head. Like, you may never see him again. See him or her again, or yeah. Uh, if you do, uh, what circumstances would it be, and what their jobs would be like, and how contrast to yours? Like, this is uh, almost a human experience that we've all gonna have to experience at one point. Like, I think this is why cinema is definitely more of a human instrument of our emotions at best. Like, uh, this is definitely an emotional roller coaster, and you do feel a lot of empathy and sympathy for all the characters that are involved. Like going through all their journeys and they're pretty much uh, learning what uh, their own dueling uh, childhoods and their dueling teenhoods and their dueling adulthoods uh, come clashing together and into this. Number six, we have John Wick Chapter 4. Uh, after pretty much uh, uh, having the most gigantic of gigantic comebacks and being a, a totally very nice person in real life, Keanu Reeves pretty much knocks it out of the uh, park with John Wick Chapter 4, like, this was everything everyone, including me, loves about the John Wick franchise, but elevated to, uh, essentially notched up to 11 at this point, like, the action's at its best, yes, the violence is at its best, yes, the cinematography is at its best, yes, the character development is at its best, yes, and the interworld uh, building and how everything all operates, it's, uh, at a game in this movie, like th this is uh, definitely a satisfying conclusion. In, in, what, in my opinion, one of the biggest franchises that came out of the 2010s, and this is definitely one of the most enthralling, like edge of your seat, entertaining films you're definitely gonna have to see uh, at any uh, time of the year. Like this movie, essentially devoured and cannibalized Expendables 4. Like Expendables just took a whole a decade to do a whole sequel that turned out to be un unbelievably rubbish. John Wick uh, pretty much did its entire franchise in a bit over four years, bit over a decade. But again, this is absolutely brilliant. This movie, I'm just so pleased that uh, we're getting a spin-off ballerina. If it does come out, since we haven't seen any trailers yet, but this is like probably the. Uh, the, the closest thing to peak action films that most superhero movies this year could not capture. For number five, it's Barbie, the Gergo Work movie, uh, based on a toy line of the same name, and of course, an absolute meme engine, considering that it did come out the same day as Oppenheimer, and that movie was just one of the most funniest films ever made. And discussions about the woman's place in a wide society and a patriarchy, and Pretty much uh, America's relationship with Barbie and Barbie's relationship with American culture, which is again a very brilliant movie in my opinion, and uh, and also very thought provoking at best. Like you're you're expecting like a nice cheesy comedy, but it's almost like a quarter life crisis at best. Something like The Truman Show or like or something Greg Oak's other film like uh, Francis Ha maybe as well. But uh, this movie, uh, both design-wise, is uh, pretty much uh, really good as well. The acting of Ryan Gosling and Margot Robbie, they all give it all the talent they have in this movie. The soundtrack is absolutely brilliant, particularly the Billy Eyes song, What Was I Made For? And and also, the movie's camp factor uh, doesn't like uh, completely devour the movie uh, to a sense where it just comes off as a little too cheesy. But again, this is a, definitely a very, very strong uh, case of being in the central zeitgeist of 2023 and being a very good example of that. At number four, it's a tie between two films. Uh, it's Suzumi and Poor Things. Again, I've had a, a major tribulation, like which is the better film of 
of these two films, so I said, you know what, screw it, I'm just going to uh, do it as a tie, so here we are! For Poor Things, it's basically about a woman's liberation, and of, and of course her self-personal conquest in uh, her own experience and her own discovery and odyssey of a world around her. Um, and of course, uh, Yorgos Slamfamous' trademark dark humour with an off-kilter uh, edge and being a costume uh, comedy as well, like his previous film, The Favourite, and Emma Stone, Willem Dafoe and Mark Ruffalo are all brilliant in this movie. And of course the movie visually looks marvellous. And of course we go over to Zuzumi, which I'll say from precision. The animation is uh, like his other films, Being Your Name, Weathering With You, is absolutely gorgeous. And this is uh, the first time I'm seeing this film on the big screen, which is Probably an extremely awarding experience and the music in that movie is almost like being in the midst of a concert where all the beats kind of rivel up into your body like vibrations. The, uh, the, uh, the characters are very charming and very likeable and definitely explores into the themes of, uh, of people just kind of moving away from like earthquakes and personal trauma around uh, natural disasters. It's a very uh, deep and introspective movie about how to move on from trauma and while Paul Fink is definitely about uh, a woman wa uh, wanting to be free yet also child-minded. So number four is a tie between Zuzumi and Paul Fink. So really take a bet on which is uh, the true number four but it's a tie in my end. At number three it's also another movie that got uh, memed on uh, thanks to Barbie. Here's a clue and, and here it's DVD. It's Oppenheimer at number three, and also support physical media like your life depends on it. And also, Oppenheimer is definitely Christopher Nolan's darkest movie out there, particularly with the paranoia of uh, what you've just created being a nuclear bomb and how you deal with the consequences and how you basically live with them for the rest of your life essentially. And even though unfortunately we now live in a new nuclear aid with Russia essentially threatening us with nukes over Ukraine war, unfortunately. But this movie is probably an intriguing and very insightful movie, in my opinion. And basically, uh, your personal guilt, uh, or Oppenheimer's personal guilt around uh, building the weapon, and essentially his uh, uh, his complicated relationship uh, around, techno around its technology, like he openly was critical about the hydrogen bomb as well. Uh, this is just a very, very uh, uh, enthralling movie that uh, surprisingly got a lot of people like uh, thinking about uh, uh, what, how do we get there and how do we get out of it, of course. Uh, this is a, uh, a movie that even I myself, a history buff, was totally on board with even before the Barbenheimer madness just took over the Twitterverse, in my opinion. The acting of Killian Murphy, Robert Downey Jr. and of course and Florence Pugh and Emily Blunt were all brilliant in the movie. The cinematography is absolutely gorgeous. The music by Lyra Gorison is definitely the best that came out this year in my opinion. And of course the movie is just a visual treat for your eyes, particularly seeing the uh, them uh, doing the Trinity test which is definitely uh, one of the most uh, 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 dramatic and enthralling moments you should see on big screen that came all year round. For number two, this is definitely just as dark, just as long, just as set in a desert -y town, and just as showing America's complicated history, it's Martin Scorsese's Killers of the Flower Moon. Like, this is a brilliant movie. Like, I've seen this at the big screen and it paid, it paid off in loads. Like, even though I did, yes, yeah, sit down for a three hour and 20 minute long movie about America's really not so great relationship with the natives, uh, particularly with the Osage Nation. Uh, but, uh, like I said, the movie is just astonishingly good. The film's cinematography is absolutely at its A game. The music by the unfortunately passed away Robert, uh, uh, who I've, his name is completely escaped me, is absolutely brilliant. The direction that Martin Scorsese takes with the characters and the world setting, uh, particularly the world building that's set mostly in this little town, is 
really big as well and really uh, well done. You do understand the scope and the weight of the character's decision that weighs on their minds. The performances of Robert Downey Jr., Leonardo DiCaprio and particularly my favourite performance of the movie is Lily Gladstone who is absolutely brilliant and should definitely be deserving that Oscar like any given day. If it gets snob, I'm going to riot at this point. Uh, the movie is definitely a testament to the, the the Osage Nation people who unfortunately were under the thumb of uh, almost some really evil people that oppressed them like over like 300, 400 years which is definitely or like uh, just hundreds and hundreds of years which is just uh, really sad to get into and seeing that representation uh, finally land on the big, sc big screen and the audience finally taking in the intention span to watch this movie in all of its glory no matter how dark it is in my opinion and not three hours and 20 minutes was wasted in this movie and definitely uh, one film you definitely want to uh, check out regardless of a uh, way you stand in, in, this situ uh, in that situation whether you know lots about the native history or don't uh, know a lot about it or have a somewhat of a preliminary understanding about it like I do. And my favorite film of 2023 is Hayao Miyazaki's Boy and the Heron. Like, uh, this is coming out of it after a retirement announcement, after Wind Rises. Then it, he essentially just went on a 10 year long hiatus. And after some production setbacks to, uh, due to production issues and COVID, he finally came back after a 10 year hiatus. And he definitely, he definitely delivered his most spiritual movie at best. And definitely has a more of a tortured feel as well. So the movie is also semi-autobiographical as well as he did uh, grow up outside of Tokyo away from the bombing raids and also had a father who uh, owned like an aircraft factory for the Japanese Imperialist Army as well. Uh, and also the music of Joe Hisasashi is so well deserved of its recognition and so beautiful as well that it finally got attention in the, war in the award circles around the world thankfully. The direction and also the ideals and writing of Hayao Miyazaki are very ever present in this movie, in, uh, which is very pleasing in my opinion. And even though he has directed uh, one of my personal favorite films, *Be Spirited Away*, and the animation of that film and this film definitely do uh, shine through, give, yeah, giving how uh, uh, gorgeous and uh, bright and very detailed the animation is, and how much world building uh, happens in this movie from a little amount of space that it takes place in uh, being essentially in an abandoned tower that's off the uh, the factory's complex and a mansion that also happens in the movie and dealing with the personal trauma of losing a loved one particularly during a bombing raid which is uh, again something that Studio Ghibli did touch on particularly in films like Grave of Fireflies as well the the voice acting of particularly of Robert Pattinson uh, does uh, show Robert Pattinson's more uh, more of his acceptance to more unorthodox and more weird and more out there films uh, in his catalogue. Again, this is a very beautiful, definitely a very gorgeous movie, and definitely Hayao Miyazaki's triumphant return after a very long hiatus and already looking like a very bright future for Studio Ghibli and and for its fans like me. So, these were my top 10 films of 2023. Let me know in the comments what you think of my list and what your favorite films are for this year. And let me, and please subscribe to my channel. Please like my video. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram and Letterboxd. And this is Elijah Wells. And bye.